Hello, everyone, and welcome to Future Housing and the Innovative City. Um, I'm going to wait for a few moments for our attendees to enter, and I'll be starting in about a minute's time. Thank you. Okay, hello everyone and welcome. Um, this is Future Housing and the Innovative City. Um, this is an event uh, that is part of the Asia Pacific Architecture Festival. It is organized by the Singapore University of Technology and Design's Architecture and Sustainable Design Pillar. And this event is in coordination with the launch of our Inform Reform publication series, uh, issue two of which, uh, Housing Next, is now available. I'm Peter Ortner. I'm Assistant Professor for Architecture and Sustainable Design at SUTD, and I will be the moderator for today's discussion. In today's dialogue, we'll be reflecting on the changes the past year has brought for our cities and for urban housing, and asking how we may respond as town planners, urban designers, and architects in our future work. How urban housing can contribute to the innovative city is the guiding theme of today's discussion. We will ask if the past year's global experiment with telecommuting instigated by the pandemic will have long-term impacts, not only on the design of our homes, but ultimately also for the design of uh, innovative cities. I hope to also touch on the topics of resilience and public space during our discussion, as time permits. Uh, I'm very honored to share our virtual stage today with two distinguished guests. Uh, joining us in our panel discussion is Dr. Ben Buchsein, Professor of Urban Design at the Technical University of Munich. Uh, Dr. Buchsein joined TU Munich in 2018, bringing expertise in the design of airport cities, uh, urban design, and architecture. Uh, the topic of his 2017 book, uh, Noise Landscape, uh, featured these themes. He is founding architect of BHSF Architects, an award-winning practice with expertise in residential architecture and urban design. From 2005 to 2018, he was editor of Kaminson Magazine. During this period, he earned his doctoral degree from the ETH Zurich and published the book Gray Architecture in 2010. He has taught and conducted research at the ETH in collaboration with Felix Klaus and Kais Christiansa. Our featured presenter today is Dr. Chong Kun Hyun, Chairman of the Center for Livable Cities and the incoming Chairman of SUTD's Lee Kuan Yew Center for Innovative Cities in June 2021. She was formerly the CEO of the Housing and Development Board here in Singapore from 2010 to, tw uh, to 2020, uh, overseeing some 1 million public housing flats. At the HDB, she introduced a new generation of well-designed, community-centric, sustainable, and smart public housing. Dr. Chong was also CEO of Urban Redevelopment Authority from 2004 to 2010, and concurrently the Deputy Secretary of the Ministry of National Development from 2001 to 2016, with extensive experience in land use planning, urban design, conservation of built heritage, and the real estate market. She played a key role in major urban transformations locally and internationally, such as the development of Marina Bay, and the master planning of Tianjin Eco City. She serves on numerous advisory panels, including the World Economic Forum, and is also the chairman of the Lee Kuan Yew World City Prizes Nominating Committee, board trustee of NUS and a fellow for life and honorary fellow of the Singapore Institute of Architects and Institute of Planners, respectively. She's a current council member and former deputy president of the International Federation of Housing and Planning and global board trustee of the Urban Land Institute. In 2018, she was appointed the Institute of Policy Studies fifth SR Nathan Fellow. Dr. Chong has received numerous awards, notably the Meritorious Service Medal for Outstanding Public Service, and is the first Asian to receive both the Urban Land Institute's Prize for Urban Visionaries and the Lynn S. Beadle Lifetime Achievement Award by the Council for Tall Buildings and Urban Habitat. 
Dr. Chong, it is a great honor and a great pleasure to have you join us today. Uh, may I invite you now to uh, share with us on recent developments in urban housing and innovative cities. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Peter. Uh, can you hear me well? Okay, great. Well, uh, good afternoon, everyone uh, from Singapore. And for some of you tuning in, it could be morning or either in the evening. Uh, very nice uh, to have all of you tune in. Uh, Pete has asked me to speak, and I thought that since his publication is going to be called Housing Next, I would borrow that title and cover what I think are the challenges and considerations for the design of housing and particularly for the next generation of housing. I think housing never exists on its own, but always in context of the larger picture. And we need to understand this in order to design housing well. And I will share a little bit of my experience also in the development of public housing. So let's start with the challenges. What are some of the challenges that we see uh, would be facing us in the design? Uh, well, in town planning, in urban planning, as well as in housing. First, I think the first challenge, first cluster of challenges, I call them changing population, social, cultural, and economic uh, demographics. The first challenge is really that the world is getting older. And uh, as we can see in this slide, and generally the elderly population is expected to increase from 9% to 16% by 2050. And what about Singapore? We are one of the fastest aging countries in the world. And our elderly, who are more than 65 years old, can be expected to make up almost half of the population by 2050. And of course, with that will come a lot of issues that has to do with health, such that as uh, dementia and frailty, and uh, concerns about the mental uh, well-being concerns of many of these elderly. And of course, there are changing family structures. In fact, in most parts of the more developed world, there's a shrinking household size, smaller families, increasing singlehood, and these will all increase the rate of household formation, meaning you need a lot more dwelling places for them. But on the other hand, aging may lead to the formation of more multi-generation households for mutual care and support. And on the right of this slide, I show some statistics about uh, this changing family structure in Singapore. I will not run through in great detail. And of course, there are many new ways of living between different generations. One is that of co-housing, which is really intentional community or private homes. They could be senior or multi-generational families that are clustered around shared spaces, such as common kitchens, dining and laundry. And more and more you do start to see home sharing where seniors who have available housing space are paired with younger occupants who provide social support and assistance and of course enjoy lower rent in return. So it's made up for the social company that you give to the elderly. And co-living, which has become quite popular among the young, it's really a plug and play housing of a more temporal nature where you have individual units or rooms grouped around common areas and activities that facilitate uh, interaction. But we are also seeing increasing diversity in society. The net international migration is now dominant in population change in most Western European and the Anglosphere, covering US, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. And in Singapore in 2018, already 40% of Singapore's population was made up of foreigners, uh, permanent residents, and new citizens. So we have increasing diversity in society. And of course, with social media, the big question is, will it lessen physical connections and social cohesion? Who is my neighbor? It used to be the guy next door, but it's not so anymore. So that's a big question for us uh, to deal with from a social point of view. And of course, rising inequality, which is happening all over the world. The share of national income going to the top 10% income earners have grown tremendously as shown in the graph on the right. 
and there's a worldwide trend of rising inequality. The richest 1% actually own 44% of the world's wealth and there's unequal access to housing and amenities and utilities. The urban population that do not have access to affordable and secure housing will grow from 1.2 to 1.6 billion by 2025. And this inequality is going to be further exacerbated by the digital divide. But people continue to have rising aspirations. Even in Singapore, where home ownership is so high, about 73% of the housing development board flats, which is the public housing flats, uh, the residents below 35 years old aspire for better housing based on a recent household uh, survey that we did. And the housing aspirations of households in foreign flats or smaller has risen. The next grouping of challenges have to do with disruptions coming from climate change, environment and sustainability issues and pandemics. Climate change means that there's an increase in global temperatures, rising sea levels, and intensity and frequency of storms and droughts, which we are all experiencing. And there's an urgent need to reduce carbon emissions in order to hold the rise in global average temperatures to below 2 degrees Celsius, as set out in the 2015 Paris Climate Agreement, although the world is not doing so well on this front. And post-pandemic considerations means that we have greater health concerns of density living, whether it's in workplaces, commercial spaces, and in our living arrangements. There's a change in lifestyles, more learn and work from home, e-commerce, lots of concerns about peak travel congestion, particularly in public transport, which you don't want during a pandemic. And there's a lot for us to think about in terms of future urban logistics, uh, whether it's because of the surge in deliveries or the surge in the type of waste that we're generating, all require new urban solutions. The third group of challenges are really about technology disruptions and opportunities. We all know about the fourth revolution, and some say we're going to the fifth revolution. And with sensors, big data, analytics, internet of things, robotics, human augmentation, AI, sharing economy and e-commerce, it has completely transformed and continues to transform our lives. And even mobility trends with unmanned area vehicles and uh, AV, autonomous and electric vehicles, it all requires to rethink about how people move. What do we do about parking? It may not be cars that we need to park, maybe they're drones, you know. And to rethink supporting infrastructure, you now need more charging points for electric vehicles, for example. So you have flying taxis by like Uber, Amazon's delivery centers, uh, Amazon's flying warehouse, all these are being trialed. They're no longer just fiction. So for housing, what are the considerations? What do we think about with all these challenges and changes and disruptions? Well, there's definitely a need for stronger affirmation actions to provide affordable quality housing for a more inclusive and equitable society, given that there's widening inequality around the world. And there must be increased efforts on achieving sustainability, resilience, with a new focus on health and wellness. And we have to develop age-friendly housing and neighbourhoods, not just for the elderly, but for all ages. This requires us to think about new typologies, review the type typologies we already have. Should there be smaller units, larger multi-generation homes, assisted living? Uh, what types of living arrangements? and more flexible space for work from home and learning arrangements. And it is also about designing to facilitate community bonding and social cohesion, and to rethink amenities and infrastructure which have to serve new lifestyles. And of course, we need to harness innovation, science and technology in trying to achieve all these. So, so many things to think about, what do we do? Well, I'd like to just share the experience of Singapore's public housing program it serves to provide affordable housing for a more inclusive society. We are mindful of these challenges and it's very much a work in progress. So I'd like to just share some of our experience in how we look at housing and how we try to deal with all these challenges. Singapore's public housing is unusual because it houses more than 80% of the resident population, you know, 1.1 million uh, HDB or housing development board flats in 26 towns and estates. 
And the unusual thing is that 94% of the people actually own their homes with only 6% rental. So Singapore has one of the highest home ownership rates in the world at more than 90%. And how do we make housing affordable? I think first, you have to safeguard land for public housing in all our long-term plans, which we do. Every long-term plan that we prepare, such as a concept plan, we safeguard land for housing and public housing. And we provide generous subsidies and grants. We allow people to pay their mortgages using a compulsory savings scheme. And we price the flats based on uh, income levels. And as a result, the house price to income ratio in Singapore compared with some of the global cities in the world is far, far lower. For example, Hong Kong is at 20.8, Singapore is at 4.7. So global cities face a big challenge in providing affordable housing. And we spread the public housing throughout the island, where a city state, and they are very well served by key commercial nodes uh, and the mass rapid transit, meaning you have access to amenities and good public transport. And they are also very well served by greenery and parks and park connectors linking up all the parks. So these are the basic infrastructure, even as we plan the towns. But as you come to the town level, when we plan in great detail, we really aim for quality living environment, which is very important. So how do we do this? I'm going to explain in the next couple of slides. First, at the town level, we have to plan for self-sufficiency. All the amenities you need for work, live, play, learn, served by a very good transport infrastructure. And one of the key features of the public housing towns is that it's planned as neighbourhoods. Neighbourhood concept comprising four to 6,000 dwelling units each in a neighbourhood, which are further broken down into precincts of 600 to 800 uh, dwelling units each served by precinct shops. So there's a whole hierarchy of facilities in the town uh, at the, the town centre level, which are bigger, to the neighbourhood centre, to the precinct level. They are all well served by amenities and well connected by public transport, cycling networks, walking paths, and sheltered lingways. And there's a whole comprehensive network uh, for walking and cycling. Now, as a result of this, we are able to, in the Land Transport Master Plan 2040, plan for 20-minute towns and a 45-minute city, making uh, Singapore movement around very, very convenient. Interestingly, the neighborhood concept turned out to be quite resilient during the pandemic because each neighborhood is really a self-sufficient bubble with amenities uh, which, within walking distance or you could cycle to them. And this completely puts less pressure on public transport, particularly during pandemics where you don't want the congestion. We use urban design to scout our towns. So if we have a clear strategic planning vision, we understand the urban design intent of creating distinctive characters, uh, being, bringing in public spaces, a blue and green environment. We can use all the tools of urban design. This is almost classical Kevin Lynch to actually design the town. I won't have time to go into detail, but we do look at urban design in great detail. And as a result, we can develop very quality, high quality urban design and innovative typologies, which require to be suitable for the context that we are planning for that specific town. Whatever typologies uh, there are, terrace models, courtyard models, uh, tower models, and of course, a lot more. And as a result, these are the types of innovative building typologies for high density, high rise development in Singapore, incorporating sky rise greenery and recreation spaces, community living rooms, and lots of common spaces. And interesting ideas like village clusters in the sky. This is a project done by Woha, where you group 60 to 80 units as a group, and then they're each served by a garden in the sky. So these are interesting typologies. We look into very detailed design, offering a wide range of options for different budgets and needs and family structures, from smaller room flats, two rooms, all the way to three generation flats, smaller flats for uh, singles or, or people who are just two persons, all the way to multi-family type flats. And lately, we're introducing the community uh, assisted living apartments, uh, which will be launched and piloted very soon, where there are smaller studios, but 
having people share communal spaces. So these are assisted living for the elderly. And all our layouts, we are striving for them to be flexible. All the structures, columns are pushed to the sides, meaning that you can change a home for a home office, for a young couple, or for a family. The walls can be taken down and reconfigured. And you can many, many different types of layout. These are real pictures of public housing flats in Singapore. Unique interiors, home offices, open plans, and flexible layouts. Now, we are moving into a focus on health and wellness. So in the new designs, we want to consciously facilitate active lifestyles and enhance design facilities to be more fun. Uh, try to motivate people to walk instead of taking the lift. We're combining a couple of car park rooftop gardens and we are going to introduce a sport circuit where you can run, for example. Right? And we are very mindful that we need to foster a safe and inclusive environment, particularly for the elderly. So in the way you design, wayfinding, the use of colours become very important for the elderly as eyesights are, fade, are fading. And also designing for the uh, people who have more and more people having dementia. Wayfinding becomes absolutely important. We're only also harnessing green and blue to mitigate high densities. But we apply biophilic principles using flora, fauna, uh, soil, water to create better outdoor comfort, having designed landscapes with people in mind. Again, I won't have time to go into the biophilic designs, but we want to design to engage the mind, provide tranquil spaces for relaxation in a very high density environment. And lately, we're also converting a lot of the rooftops for urban farming to hit our goals to provide 30% of nutrient needs locally by 2030. And we are designing towns with urban farming, for example, at Tuna. And of course, we want to achieve a car like Singapore, looking at greater emphasis on walk, cycle, ride, uh, piloting AVs. These are all real. We are going to pilot them very soon. Pilot car-free town centres and bus transit corridors. And with accelerated e-commerce, we have to cater to new delivery patterns and last mile deliveries. We are rolling out an island-wide federated uh, locker network for collection of parcels. We're going to use drones, more robots for deliveries as well. And in the design of the neighborhood center, we have to be mindful that there are places we want people to gather. So they are a good mix of users. They have to be experiential to attract people providing great public spaces for interaction and designing them to be green and sustainable. This is one of the latest new generation neighborhood centers. And neighborhood centers can be social and wellness hubs as well, providing uh, healthier food choices, for example, locating uh, health types of shops for exercises, for cycling into these neighborhoods to encourage people. Lots of public spaces, town squares which are large for mass events, social verandas, pre-generation playgrounds for interstitial meetings and community living rooms for every block for people to mingle and to interact. So we also need to harness science and technology in the use of all these. So for the Housing and Development Board, HDB, we already worked on sustainable development frameworks since 2011 and then smart technologies since 2014. And then we introduced biophilic frameworks and principles in 2018. And going forward in the next 10 years with a big focus on holistic well being. So, all our towns are now planned with the help of computer simulations to look at wind flows, to get better air quality, to model noise to look at solar irradiance and sunshine analysis so that we know where to put our solar panels to optimize sunlight, for example. And uh, we have introduced many smart and sustainable initiatives. I won't go through covering energy, urban greenery, waste and water, living environments, and building technology. In fact, the HDB is the largest driver for solar PV systems installation in Singapore through our Solar Nova program. And we're targeting uh, using renewable energy uh, to hit 540 megawatt peak by 2030. And you can power some 135,000 four-room flats uh, with such a generation of power. In fact, all the common areas 
uh, the electricity needs will be powered by solar PV. And of course, estate management, we are going to optimize the use of sensors. We have uh, develop a smart hub where we collect a lot of data from sensors for lifts, water pumps, lighting, irrigation. And with this, we can analyze the data and optimize our estate services and also introduce predictive maintenance to try to fix your lifts before they break down, hopefully, and you're able to optimize a lot of these estate services and facilities management. Now, it's just about smart living. We're going to bring in and make all our public housing flats smart and able. And you can easily subscribe for Wi-Fi. Broadband fiber we brought in. You can, uh, because it's smart and able, you can subscribe for elderly monitoring systems, utilities management systems, and telehealth. With the pandemic, in fact, a lot of people shifted to telehealth. And because all our flats, you can get Wi-Fi, it was, uh, and using data plans, you can actually access doctors from home. And as a result, also many people could work from home and also study from home. And our first smart precinct would be Pongo North Shore, which is completing these couple of months with all these smart applications being applied. And the smart application also help us to derive our sustainability goals to save energy and water, to generate renewable energy through solar PV generation, and to increase the amount of recycled waste. So I think it's about also about uh, managing behavior and uh, uh, getting people to be uh, uh, more green, because green towns really need green people. Well, I'd like to just close my comments by saying that Trying to do all these, doing R&D is very, very crucial. So for the HDB, we have an R&D framework where we do research and development at the design stage, types of typologies, uh, types of prefabricated, prefinished volumetric construction, for example. We uh, use a BIM for design. We look at material science for logistics and construction. 3D fabrication, we have one of the largest 3D printers in Southeast Asia. And we're looking now into smart integrated construction and the precast automation, trying to reduce the number of workers that we need in construction industry and to boost productivity. And post-construction, we're looking at robotics for, to help us in maintenance. And as I've also mentioned, the use of sensors and smart hubs that greatly increase the efficacy of your facility management. So R&D is extremely important for us to keep ahead and to manage and optimize for uh, safety, for high productivity, and uh, for effective, cost-effective construction as well. So with that, I'm going to just end there. And that gives a flavor of what we're trying to do. It's very much a work in progress and we're always learning, but uh, hopefully we're able to address many of the challenges that come with the design of housing. And of course, as you have seen, it's not just about housing. It is about the planning of entire ecosystems and entire town and how that those towns are actually plugged into national planning and urban planning. Okay, thank you. I will just stop there. Okay, thank you, you so Thank you so much, Dr. Chong. Thank you for sharing this really expansive framework for the understanding of future urban housing design. Uh, very, very few people can bring as much expertise experience and intelligence to this topic. So it's it's a huge privilege to have you here with us today. Thank you for sharing. Um, I should also add, it's inspiring to see how these vision, visions are becoming a reality in Singapore with the Housing and Development Board. So it's great to see that as well. To begin the dialogue, um, I would now like to invite uh, Dr. Booksign to join us in discussing, uh, discussing our first topic of the day. So the past year's pandemic has prompted us to reimagine our homes as also our primary places of work. This change, among others, has had rapid impacts on our home lives and our use of digital technologies, but we're really only beginning to catch up with how it's going to change our design of urban housing and town planning in the future. Um, so today I'm gonna to invite our uh, distinguished guests to reflect on how these changes should change uh, urban housing and to begin to also address the question of innovation. 
Can a telecommuting city, can a work from home city still be an innovative city? So on, on, uh, on the topic, on the first question on innovation, um, urban innovation is often described as relying on serendipitous contact between businesses, individuals, and ideas. Uh, urban economists use the term economies of agglomeration to describe the ability of dense cities to drive economic growth, foster innovation, uh, and even attract the creative class. Um, if we are moving, or if we move toward the city of digitized home working, where commerce is largely executed by delivery, do our cities risk losing their innovative edge? And how might our design of housing and town planning respond to promote innovation? Maybe we can get Ben to share first. Okay. <laughs> Okay, thanks a lot. Oh, it was very interesting to listen to you. And thanks again also from my side for the comprehensive uh, presentation. Um, of course, I will largely speak from a more European perspective where we have uh, basically the same challenges, but different um, ways uh, how we have to and should work. Um, with it. And um, I think uh, at least in, in, in my part of Europe or in my bubble of discussion, we try to think also more about retrofitting, about uh, adapting the, the, the systems which we have already built because um, I'm, I'm one of the, the persons who say we should uh, uh, stop building and, and start um, um, uh, retrofitting because we already built too much. Um, and also, in terms of the pandemic, there's a, I think there's differences uh, in dealing with uh, with this issue in, in in parts of Europe and parts of Asia, which we um, yeah we should have in the background. I observe that the, the 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 collective thinking is maybe here not as strong as it is in 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 your societies, and that it's more difficult for people to adapt also to um, to um, having some restrictions on the on the way of life. So it's an in, in, important lesson to learn actually. And I'm, I'm really interested how our societies will adapt to the future pandemics, which are sure to come. Huh? Um, that's as a general, uh, as, a, as a general note, but the global, the global um, challenges are all the same. In terms of the digitalization and the housing, uh, I thought a bit, little bit about this and I think it will be a complex and, and, and mixed and half-half um, and, uh, answer because uh, I think that really cities are about interaction, about physical interaction, um, about meeting people from different spheres of life, about uh, seeing that different people um, have different lifestyles, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So I think it's a, it's a huge importance that this stays. Um, but I think with uh, digitalization and, and the, the pandemic has just served as a, um, we, we pretty much agree here when we discuss it that it has served as an accelerator of things that were about to come anyway. Um, the transformation, at least here in Munich, of, uh, of the inner city um, uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a shopping destination, this will, this will surely change. But it will also be the possibility to introduce new um, mixed use um, ideas. Uh, I think you can also see it positively. Um, but I think people will return to the workplace, but they will maybe only return half of the week and then stay home the other half. Um, this will um, alleviate some of the um, traffic congestion, congestion problems maybe. It will um, give chances to, um, to, to have different waves of, of movements at different times of day. Um, and it will, of course, increase the importance. At least that's, that's what I hope of the immediate neighborhood. Because I think in many, let's say, single family home districts, you can observe that people are just um, living there in the night and, and commuting at day. And I think it could be a chance to, um, to, to strengthen these neighborhoods. I mean, in the end, we are all humans and we need to interact and we will shift our interactions to different places. That's kind of my, um, my hope in this respect. Okay, maybe I, I add a little bit to what Ben has said. Um, I think your question is really, will our cities uh, risk losing their innovative edge? Maybe I, I, I well, when you asked that question, I, I, I looked up some statistics. Now we work 
in partnership with Bright Spot Strategy, actually launched and completed a survey in July 2020. And these are some of the results, right? The ability to meet and brainstorm dropped an average of 11%. The ability to maintain social relationships declined an average of 17%. The ability to have unplanned interactions dropped the most at 25%. But 90% of people want to return to the office at least once a week. And 20% wants to return five days a week. So we don't know how this will pan out. I think uh, that was in July. And uh, so we don't know, right? And studies have actually shown that productivity has actually remained stable. I think initially we were all worried if we all stayed at home, the work won't get done, you know. But it's been a year and the work gets done, right? So productivity has remained stable and for some companies, they felt it increased because uh, uh, when they shifted to remote during the pandemic, that's probably because we merge our off time and our on time and we just keep working, you know. Uh, but innovation, on the other hand, has dramatically reduced. So mm -hmm. your productivity is stable, but innovation may have reduced. Because the businesses tend to spend less money and they take fewer risks during uncertain times. Of course, post-pandemic, things might improve, right? And we also know from research that uh, innovation and creativity often happens through collaboration. So the deficit of innovation right now is, could be due to the difficulties that remote working brings to collaboration, right? Video conferencing and instant messaging apps, they can't perfectly replicate the dynamics of uh, being together in the same room, hashing out ideas, feeding off the energy of your co-workers. It's not the same with having a cup of coffee together and just talking. And uh, I suppose going forward, a likely scenario is really a hybrid situation. Right now, we still don't know what percentage will go back. I think it will be a hybrid. People have enjoyed working from home, but at the same time, they do miss the interaction. So maybe working from home for a few days uh, with team meetings back in the office. All right. And what is likely to happen is employers will probably have to give workers more flexibility. I think they've enjoyed, they had tasted what it is to have this flexibility. So if your company wants to keep talent, you probably do need to give more flexibility, right? Uh, I think particularly even universities, you know. So, um, so what, what can we do with this hybrid? I think you also said, so how do town planning respond to this innovation? I think we would just have to take it step to step, uh, step by step. But one idea really is, I mean, I was looking at the public housing towns that we have. The challenge is that uh, everybody lives at home and you have your children there and you're trying to work. You're sort of getting into each other's way. And to a certain extent, Perhaps in the future, you might be able to provide some co-working spaces that are nearer to the home. So at least you could walk to the co-working space if you have a, a, a meeting. You need to have a, a small meeting, right? And to just walk there and have some peace and quiet and pay, pay for a room for an hour or two and have that meeting. Uh, if your children are, are noisy at home and, and you don't have the privacy. Uh, actually, it's quite interesting. One of my, my colleagues uh, from the social side told me that one of the challenges they had when people were working from home or staying at home was, where, was that when they needed to do counselling, they needed to find a place that's private to actually counsel people. So actually, if you think about it, if they can meet in a room somewhere, and, it, and this need not be your expensive co-working co spaces. You know, They could be... Uh, located even in a library or a community club. And for those of you tuning in, if you don't know what that is, in Singapore, in every town, we have lots of libraries. We have lots of community clubs. We provide community facilities where people uh, play games. They, they have uh, places where people get together to meet and have uh, a mass events. And you can actually provide rooms where people can, when you need some peace and quiet, you can study there or you could, have your meetings or, or your council, you know. So I think some of these spaces we need to start to think about. Now, we it's not as if we haven't thought about this, right? Co-working is already very popular, but so far they tend to be located nearer the city because they're more viable commercially when they're nearer the commercial nodes. 
But I think if you have a more disaggregated working arrangement, maybe it becomes more viable to provide them at the neighborhood level, a town and a neighborhood, uh, neighborhood level as well, in the case particularly of Singapore. So maybe I'll just stop there. Yeah, I think that's a new need that we're seeing is that yeah, co-working in the neighborhood level could be something that really helps. Uh, ben, I also love the point on diversity that you brought up, right? Because in the city, it's not just innovation, it's not just exchanging ideas, it's seeing people that are different from us and, uh, and how that, that, that changes us and, and broadens our perspective. So I hope we'll come back to that in a section on public space at the end of this discussion. But before we go to public space, I wanna ask a question about resilience. So in the past year, we've seen how different urban habitats can be more or less resilient in the face of the pandemic um, in terms of their ability to prevent disease spread, for example, but maybe more importantly, to sustain us in unexpected and trying circumstances and especially in isolation. Uh, as designers, as town planners, um, have you seen examples uh, that have struck you as being particularly resilient? And is there a design change that you've, you've thought about that could increase the resilience of urban housing? Ben, if you want to jump in, please. Well, the, the problem here was or is that, um, of course, uh, urban design is a very slow um, responding uh, discipline. So we, we calculate in tens or, or twenties of years. Um, but, but maybe here I could bring in the, the observation, at least from some central European cities, that we saw the ability to, to do temporary adaptations of public space. So it's, I think that, that housing is, is slow to change and it's more like an invisible change that takes place. But at least the city authorities took the, um, the possibility of this, um, uh, of this pandemic situation to test out some things, um, for example, um, temporary um, um, meeting places in neighborhoods, um, putting out the cars or transforming um, parking spaces into outside sitting spaces. So um, people could still um, enjoy eating in a restaurant, but uh, would be outside or doing uh, these, these kind of temporary. So I think that the main innovation that was observed is this, this testing out things which would otherwise take uh, 10 to 20 uh, years with, without a certain uh, outcome, you know, sometimes planning also is canceled at the last minute because of some crazy um, thing. And I think that this type of quick adaptation is uh, very crucial to, um, to uh, the challenges we face in the future, because we, um, we, we have the challenge that the, the, the changes that also Dr. Chong um, um, uh, indicated in the beginning, they're taking place so quickly that our paradigms are not able to, to adapt to it. So that would be my, my first answer. Yeah, just adding to one band have said, I think at the very macro level, the, the pandemic really uh, puts resilience right at the center of urban planning. And it makes us think through that we will have to plan in a way where uh, you have to be very flexible and adaptable in your urban planning. So what do I mean by that? So for example, you know, you, you, you may have to read, from, from both a planning, zoning point of view, and from, from both an architecture point of view, you would have to make sure that spaces can be converted very quickly, right? Don't worry about the zoning, you know. When, when we needed uh, lots of uh, uh, med uh, facilities, you know, to have hospital beds, for example, or to quarantine people, you have to be able to make those conversions. So for architects, in terms of design, the more flexible a space can be, they are, um, they are amicable to faster conversion of, for many types of users, right? Whether it's for stockpiling of materials, conversion to manufacturing of masks or uh, hospital uh, uh, medical facilities, correct? So I think the ability to be flexible in the conversion is important. And I think more and more we, well, this is the big question about densification, right? Uh, I do think that more and more people might move towards polycentric models mm -hmm. because uh, it spreads out density and it brings amenities very close to home. So that, you know, in lockdown is interesting, right? People locked down by countries 
by states, like in Australia, you lock down, it would be the whole Victoria or, you know, separate from New South Wales by states. And some places like China, you may lock down by neighborhoods, right? But all this suggests that this cascading of planning into highly localized polycentricity and then a localization of amenities at a neighborhood, neighborhood uh, level becomes really actually quite important, right? Giving you that flexibility and resilience when you need to impose uh, such situations without locking down the whole country. So something to think about. I think for Singapore, we've been doing that for years. So it's really more an acceleration of what we're doing. As Ben said, a lot of it is really an acceleration of some of these trends. And the idea of promoting car light and walk to ride initiatives. Now, this is only possible if you practice a distribution of amenities so that it is convenient to walk and it's convenient to cycle. If things are very far apart, you can't do that. And of course, we talk about innovative architecture for much more flexible uh, layouts, particularly in the home. And I think the idea of health and wellness and sustainability becomes very central in the whatever we plan or design or build. I think those are the key, big key things that will in, be in the mind of all of all the professionals dealing with the built environment. Again, not new, right? But it is more urgent now. We cannot just pay lip service. We have to do it. That it's so, so not new, but that's the benefit of far-sighted planning is that the city has this capacity when there's a challenge to overcome it. So for me, I, I rode taxis every day when I needed to go somewhere in Singapore. And then I discovered that there are bike lanes that can take me wherever I need to go to the East Coast Park. So there was a capacity there that I didn't know about, but when I needed to, I was able to rely on it. So I was, I was, I, you know, I appreciated that far-sighted planning. <laughs> in my own personal life in the past year. Um, the, the final question I think that we'll take here is on public space. Um, the past year has frequently asked us to be together apart. Uh, public space, however, seems to, feel to, seems to work when we feel uh, safe among strangers and somehow engaged with and interested uh, with, go with, with what's going on in our community around us. Um, in the past year, we've lost a lot of that, but we've experienced public, public space in different ways. Has the past year made you reconsider your personal definition of public space? Um, have you recon reconsidered how public space for residential neighborhoods might be redesigned in response to our, our recent experiences? Maybe you want to start this time? East, yeah. <laughs> No, please, you start this oh, time. Oh, okay, all right. Well, in, in, in my sharing, I talked a lot about public spaces. And, a, and again, public spaces, there are many types at different scales, correct? Yes. And, uh, and I always speak in the context of very high-density cities, which you find in most parts of the world, and particularly in Asia. Uh, so you need big public spaces and, and the time will come when we can interact again. And these are very important to help cities to be vibrant. But it is also about providing enough public spaces at neighborhood and even at the precinct and the block level, specific blocks of buildings where people can just get away. Uh, in a high density environment, public spaces are absolutely important to give people some respite and privacy and at times interactions. So the, the, I think it's about providing lots of public spaces of different scales, at different scales, at different distances uh, for people. You know, actually with the lockdown uh, and subsequently some slight relaxation of movement, uh, I think most people would have gone quite crazy in the home, you know, if it were not for the parks. The parks were a real lifesaver, right? And also in the case of Singapore, the park connectors, because we have a lot of these park connectors that link up all the parts, which just gives people, you know, a breath of uh, fresh air and getting out. Uh, of course, right now, the interactions are still very limited, but it will come back and then those public spaces become important. So I'll just, just stop here to hear from Ben. 
Yeah, I, I, I could totally agree. And I, I sensed, um, of course, if we don't go for the really lockdown situation where everyone has to stay home, that, that kills public space. But this was at least here the exception, like for two weeks. And then everyone was able to go out again, at least for a walk, to exercise. And I sensed a higher appreciation for public space, and maybe even an increased perception by the average citizen for this issue, because before you would have just taken it for granted or done it like in an uncautious way. But now people were really appreciating it, looking at it, using it. So I think it, 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 it even increases uh, what public space means for the persons and they, um, they really um, kind of investigate the neighborhood for possibilities to, um, to, to stay um, and to meet in a distance, to talk in a distance, et cetera. So I think for the, for the status of public space in our society could even be um, a positive um, thing. Just, just one thing that, that, that appeared to me also in, in this whole discussion about being locked down or commuting and so on and so on is an is a, is a observation that was made two or three decades ago by, uh, by Italian scientist uh, Cesare Marchetti, who, who came up with a constant. He said that he could observe in the, in the history of mankind um, from the very beginning, from the Greek towns to today, um, an average uh, of the people moving in the cities of about one hour, of course, per day. Of course, that differs, you know, from city to city, but the people want to move. They, 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 um, we, we as humans, we have it in our DNA somehow that we like movement, we like to, to commute. So if you, um, if you think about the, the future city, you will have to calculate with people having one hour of, of moving uh, in, in their daily lives. But the question is, how do you move? Do you move by foot? Do you move by bike? Or do you move by car or another like accelerated way of transport? So I think that the, the, the 20 minute city a town or the, the, the 50 minute city, these concepts are super important because they enable this, this daily movement in, in space, in public space, meeting people, going somewhere um, without um, using so many um, resources. Um, yeah, that, that, was, that was just something that, that came to my mind because I think we have to, to keep it in mind. We, we, we should not um, have the illusion that people will move less in the future, but maybe they will move <laughs> differently. Yeah, I, I'd like to just add a comment to what Ben has said. Um, I was in <laughs> another webinar the other day and we were talking about 20-minute neighborhoods. Uh, you know, this idea, of, and suddenly it's become very popular, right? 20-minute neighborhoods, 15-minute towns. I think in Paris, they're doing it. And then uh, the, the mayor wants that as a, an election, re-election platform. Uh, and of course, in Melbourne, uh, that's done too, and many other cities. And in Barcelona, where you have the super blocks and the whole idea of now expanding the super blocks, what they did is just push all the roads of the super block to the peripheral for the cars, and then inside all the roads are converted to public spaces. And then now the mayor wants to, I think, grow it to 21 blocks, 21 super blocks. These are really good ideas. But you know, the idea of the 20 minute town is actually not a new one. It is about having a very walkable city. For decades, we've been trying to do that. And if you look at the European cities, they are highly walkable. The best was when there were no cars. They were absolutely walkable, right? And then came the cars, and then now we're trying to shift back. But I, I just want to say that to achieve it, you need actually quite long-term planning. It doesn't happen overnight. Of course, there's both top-down and bottom-up. Bottom-up, like Barcelona, you just create super blocks one at a go. That's one way in, a, in a, a city that's already existing. But I think if you have a chance, you should try to do it right from the beginning. The planning has to consider the walkability of a district or the city right from the beginning. Uh, otherwise, it's really very painful to, to act, try to achieve it. it. It's not so easy. But many cities have managed to convert uh, very quickly, but it needs a lot of will because you have to remove the cars. Yeah, and, and, and also is the land use. You can remove the cars, but you've got to have the right mix of land users to make it highly convenient. So, um, thank you both so much. We're now nearing the end of the program. Um, and uh, so before um, 
before we wrap up, I'd like to say thank you, first of all, to Dr. Chong and Dr. Booksign for so generously taking the time to, to join us, to share your thoughts and experience with us. Um, I'm very humbled to share the stage with you, uh, share the screen, I should say. And uh, on behalf of SUTD uh, Architecture and Sustainable Design, and on behalf of the Asia Pacific Architecture Festival, I offer my uh, heartfelt thanks. Thank you so much. Um, before I conclude, I will share with our viewers a brief preview of SUTD's Inform Reform publication series. So the Inform Reform series explores the intersection of architectural design, uh, sustainability, and technology, and highlights groundbreaking new work at Singapore's design university, SUTD. So I'm the author of issue two, which is titled Housing Next. This, is, this issue explores how urban housing will leverage new technologies to address challenges of sustainability, resilience, and social change. Um, I take the position that housing is a verb, uh, an ongoing accommodation of people's daily lives, the seasons, the growth of families, and the weathering of materials. Shifting demographics, a changing climate, and unsustainable waste of materials and energy are changing and challenging our ways of life and forcing our homes to evolve. So this collection of essays examines how housing will change in response to these contemporary challenges and examines three key drivers, new ways of living, new mobilities, and new materialities. Uh, informed by new technologies of mobility, construction, and building simulation, the book sketches a portrait of future housing capable of affording greater sociability, connectivity, and a circular economy of ongoing material reuse. It draws on best practice examples of high-rise high-density housing from Singapore and from throughout the world. And I propose strategies for the next generation of architects to lead a broader coalition of stakeholders in the redesign of housing. So I invite you all to take a look. It's uh, uh, via Asia Pacific, Asia PAC publishers. There's a QR code here. And also to look at for future editions of the Inform Reform series. So in conclusion, uh, let me say thank you again to our distinguished guests. A big thank you to all of our viewers for joining us today. We appreciate your kind attention and we look forward to continuing the discussion in the near future on the design of sustainable, resilient and innovative cities. A big thank you to Asia Pacific Architecture Festival for generously hosting this event. So this concludes our program. Thank you all so much and goodbye. Bye, thank you. Bye. <laughs>